Hello students of Johnson University's Theology of the Trinity class. This is your lecturer, Dr. David Russell Mosley. It's a gorgeous day today, so I thought I'd uh, film this lecture outside. Um, so there were a few things that came up in the discussions that I wanted to make sure that we talked about. Um, overall, I've really been enjoying your discussions, and I love, of course, how much you guys have been uh, enjoying reading Thomas Aquinas. So, uh, one of the things that I think there was some confusion about, particularly, it was over question 35, and the issue of the word image. Uh, some of you got a little confused on whether or not the spirit is an image, um, and so on and so. I just wanted to, to cover a few things here. First, I think an important thing that, that I didn't bring up previously is the distinction between personal and essential. When Aquinas talks about things being a personal versus essential, what he means is, does it relate to a particular person of the Trinity or does it relate to the Trinity as a whole? So things like uh, father, son, um, etc. And he would say love and gift are personal names. They belong specifically as names to particular persons of the Trinity. Um, whereas like good, perfect, true, beautiful, um, those are words that would apply essentially to God. They apply to all three persons. So when we come to the word image then, we need to not think in too simplistic of terms insofar as to think, okay, so the spirit is a procession of God, therefore he looks like God, whatever that means, and therefore he is an image. It's not what Aquinas means when he's, he's using the word image. He's talking about something like a stamp or a seal, uh, where what's left behind the image uh, participates directly um, in, in what made it. It, they belong to the same species, he says, to the same kind. Um, while the Spirit is God, because he doesn't relate to the Father uh, through a son, a father-son relationship, um, he cannot be the image. Only the son can be the image, because image, you know, so I have children, and, and we could say they're in my image. Um, but my wife is not in my image. Now, she didn't come from me in any way either, so there's a breakdown in that analogy, but that's that's the kind of thing that Aquinas is talking about there. Uh, if you have any other questions on that, feel free to shoot them at me. Okay, another thing I want to talk about is something that has come up throughout a lot of these discussions, and I haven't touched on it yet, and so I'm going to do so now. Uh, at least I don't think I've touched on it. And that's the difference between apophatic and cataphatic theology. So to spell this out for you, apophatic is A-P-O-P-H-A-T-I-C. Cataphatic is K or C-A-T-P-H-A-T-I-C. So uh, essentially what those means, uh, we could also call those negative theology and positive theology. So people like uh, Aquinas, Augustine, Gregory are going to tell us that one of the primary things, when it comes to talking about God, because he is so essentially different from us, because he is, you know, we're not talking, we're not talking uh, quantitative difference. He's not simply bigger than we are. He is qualitatively different. He is, he is another, he is absolutely different from us. Uh, because of that, one of the primary ways that we can talk about God is to talk about what God is not and what is not God. Um, or, uh, another way to look at apophatic theology is to talk about, is to say what we can, and then stop when we can't, and let the mystery be in silence. So when you see them trying to define God by what he is not, that's what they're doing. They're doing apophatic theology. Now there is cataphatic theology. Cataphatic theology is positive theology. That's theology based on what we can say, on what we can positively say or describe about God. And essentially, that tends to be limited 
to what God has actually revealed about himself. Uh, so, you know, things that we can learn from scripture, um, from the tradition, etc. So that's, that's what's going on there. Um, when, when we see them talking about, when we see theologians describing God by what he is not, they're doing what we call apophatic theology. Uh, apophatic theology, uh, incidentally, is very popular uh, in two different modern streams um, outside of Western Christianity. Well, no, one of them is inside Western Christianity. So one of those is in Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, this really gets picked up on by people like Gregory of Nazianzus, whom we've read, um, but also Pseudo Dionysius, Maximus the Confessor, uh, Gregory Palamas, and, and many, many others. Um, the other strain is actually in, um, typically it's in what's called process theology, which we're not reading any process theologians uh, in this class. We are going to read some liberation theologians this week, um, but we're not reading any process theologians. Process theologians essentially believe that uh, God changes, um, that God almost evolves in a way, um, that, that he is changeable by interacting with his creatures. Uh, and so they tend to, to really like apophatic theology, or uh, what I would probably call a bastardized version of apophatic theology. Okay. Uh, the next thing I wanted to bring up, because this comes this came up a lot, especially last week, uh, was how you, or actually no, first in Augustine, and then it's come up in the last two weeks in Aquinas, and that is their use of scripture in their arguments. I think I briefly touched on this, or at least I've, I've noted it in some of the, the forums, just simply to say that it might seem like Augustine and Aquinas use a lot more scripture than Gregory does, but that's partly just that it's being signposted more for us, and it's also the texts that we read versus other texts that we didn't read. Um, but I wanted... So something, and this this actually primarily... This, this was problematic for someone when it came to Augustine, though I remember someone else now doing it with uh, scripture as well, which is in the objections, you'll see Aquinas quote a scripture or quote from Augustine or someone else to prove the objection, right? To prove the wrong answer. And then he won't always return to that scripture directly anyway, or to different scriptures in the replies. And some of you found that slightly problematic, not realizing, I think at first, that what Aquinas is actually doing there is using bad interpretations of those things. He's taking passages out of context uh, from theologians and from the Bible. And so that that's important. But there's another thing going on here that I think we have to address, and that is, despite the fact that the Restoration Movement does not officially hold to the five solas, um, what is it, sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, I forget the other two off the top of my head. Despite the fact that we don't ascribe to those officially, often we functionally ascribe particularly to sola scriptura, to scripture alone. Uh, Aquinas and the other theologians that we've read to this point do not. That's something that got developed uh, during the Reformation. Um, and What's really interesting to me about diehard sola scriptura, and this this relates too to certain ways of, of interpreting scripture when we make the historical critical method the primary method by which we interpret scripture. What's so interesting to me about that stuff is that typically it's the heretics who do that kind of thing. That is, so take for instance um, Arius or um, I forget which question now it is, but, but one of the questions where they're talking about whether or not Jesus is equal, whether the Son is equal to the Father. And he cites various passages saying that the Son is not equal to the Father from Scripture. Um, this is why Sola Scriptura can actually be very dangerous, because it can lead us to misinterpret Scripture. It can lead us to think that all we have to do is take stuff at face value, Right. All we have to do is take it at face, and if we simply take it at face value, we'll get the right reading. We'll get the right answer. And what people like Aquinas would tell us is that that's not true. You ha you can't read scripture in a vacuum. You have to read within the context of what he would call what is typically called the tradition. 
Now, that doesn't mean the tradition needs to have equal weight to Scripture the way it does for Roman Catholics um, or for Eastern Orthodox. But it does mean that we should probably pay attention to it. Because if we don't, we could get some really wrong ideas. And you see that happening all the time. Uh, now, I connected this to the historical critical method. Um, the reason I bring that up is because actually the historical critical method was developed in the 19th century by the German liberal school of theology. These are people who are beginning to deny things like the incarnation or the resurrection or that Jesus was really God. These are the same people who give us the historical critical method. So we need to keep this kind of stuff in mind. And we need to keep it in mind when we're reading ancient medieval uh, theologians is that they have a very different understanding of scripture than we tend to today. Uh, and possibly, possibly a better one. Uh, we shouldn't accept it uncritically, but we should certainly think about it. Uh, okay, so that's all I wanted to say on that. There was one last thing, and this comment uh, came, this is from something that Mike Jones wrote um, in his in his responses, and it had to do with Aquinas talking about that the only way we can love something is if we know it, um, if we have knowledge of it. And Mike understandably took some issue with that, in that, is it not possible to love God before we fully know him? Is it possible even that we might subconsciously love God and not know it? Um, I answer a resounding yes to that, and I think Aquinas would as well. Uh, this leads us to a really interesting point for me in in uh, Thomist theology, which is this around the 15th, 16th century um, and progressing forward, there came this stream of reading Thomas um, that wanted to completely separate out nature and grace. Uh, and essentially, we wanted to make those two things so completely separate because we wanted we they wanted grace to be completely gratuitous that is they didn't want god to have to give us anything so they wanted to completely separate out nature and grace um but for aquinas it's not that simple in fact it seems that in aquinas as well as in augustine and others there is this natural innate desire that we have for god um we typically call it the, the natural desire for the supernatural. And so, yes, of course, we have that in us. And to an extent, that's part of the point that Aquinas is making, is that we already have knowledge of God inside of us that we just have to reveal. We have to, somebody needs to reveal that to us uh, so that we can see it. So I hope that answered, you know, all the major questions from this week. I, I wanted to keep this video short, because um, last week I gave you a long lecture. And this week we're moving into modern theologians, um, and so we're completely uh, changing, we're shifting gears here in a lot of ways. All right, so look forward to reading your papers uh, on your chosen topics. Thank you everybody for emailing me about your topic. Um, uh, let me just address one thing there really quickly. Um, so just to clarify, what I'm wanting you to do is use your primary source, whatever, you know, Gregory's Theological Orations, Augustine's De Trin, uh, and Thomas's Summa Theologiae, and then four more sources. You can use other primary sources from your author, um, or if you want to compare them to someone else on the same issue, you can, you know, cite across streams so long as you're answering the question that's set. Um, and just so we're clear, the reason I'm assigning you other sources is because I know that these authors can be difficult to understand and so I want you to be able to use other sources to help you understand them. However, your primary focus still ought to be on the primary text that we're reading. Um, and just a reminder, you might need to read more than what was assigned for the class in order to write a really good paper. And I'm not going to point out to you what you ought to read. You look through the texts. Um, if you have physical copies of them, you know, they've got indexes, or indices, I should say. If, if you're using the online versions, they're word searchable. Um, so, you know, that's, that's that on the paper. 
Um, look forward to reading those. Look forward to seeing your discussion on the modern and contemporary theologians. All right. God bless, guys. I'll talk to you later.